Hello and good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live with my news up here at Desawe Kanda. Also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSFH channel 279. All across the world on 3news.com. I'm out for the concert tonight. We stay on the Akonsombo and Tondam spillage and it's a devastating effect focusing on what happens or what appears to be a health crisis in the affected areas and also look into the future asking if the affected structures especially these buildings that have been inundated by the flood waters will still be fit for purpose when the water recedes stay with us we have a conversation on this also we get into the matters of the quest of, of the Electoral Commission of Ghana to use the Ghana card as a sole document for the registration of voters. It has been opposed, even though the EC insists it is the most robust system. Tonight, we ask why the Ghana card and why not the Garanta system or the other means. We'll, we'll stay with it here on Ghana tonight. Also, uh, the Ghanaian economist and leadership expert, Professor Stephen Adai, has called to question the leadership of President Kufuado. We hear from the man who has enjoyed a number of appointments from the president, but he believes that the president is on the wrong path. Stay with me. We're getting to a lot more of these. Plus, your views, as always, you have a say in what we say here on Ghana Tonight. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we, we're using is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and Twitter. Let's get talking. Let's settle for Ghana Briefs. The Upper Mania District Chief Executive Joe Sam has directed a forceful evacuation official folks and residents of Akitin and communities along the Volta Lake in 48 hours to avert a disaster. The district is allocating safe havens for displaced residents. If we wait for two, three days and they are not moving, we are coming as a task force to move them because life is very precious and I don't want anybody to lose his life in this uh, uh, disaster here. So we said it should move there. So from tomorrow, They'll be moving to those areas. Uh, luckily for us, we don't have any uh, death tool. Nobody has died. They don't lose any property as in other areas. Very soon, the assembly or the dissec is taking a step that where they have they put up their structures, they shouldn't do it again. They shouldn't repeat it, it again because the water will come more than what, what we are seeing now. In the aftermath of the Akonso Modam spillage, vibrant towns have been thrust into survival mood. From submerged homes to the desperate cries of the community and other affected areas in the Volta region, the last has been marked by heartbreak and challenges just to make it through the day. The Volta River Authority, which has a statutory responsibility to ensure that the lower Volta basin is managed uh, according to law has woefully failed and this belated attempts to shift blame on uh, the meteorological services authority and uh, others others like you know uh, uh, residents failing to respond to move to higher grounds would not wash at all The flooding situation as a result of the spillage of the Akonsomo and Kwon Dams has led to an upsurge in malaria cases among children under five in displaced communities along the Volta Lake. Meanwhile, pregnant women in island communities are unable to access antenatal care, the Akitin Health Center at the Upper Manya District of the Eastern Region. <laughs> Certain persons in academia, CSOs and the media have been propagating false narratives on social media in support of a coup that threatens the nation's peace. That's according to the National Security Minister, Kandapa. He was speaking at a meeting in Accra to discuss the impact of misinformation on electoral integrity, peace and security. Civil society and the media, you must have observed, 
have been propagating false narratives in support of a coup or military rule. These actors have gained substantial followings on social media, leveraging their influence to disseminate misinformation that threaten our nation's peace and also stability. Trade's Minister Katie Hammond has escaped a possible jail term as an Accra High Court dismissed contempt charges leveled against him. Asin North MP James Jachi Singh had prayed the court to sanction the minister for saying the legislator may well leave parliament since he would end up in jail. The courts has, however, dismissed a case as lacking merit. You don't take Katie Hammond to court as a victim, as stated by their lawyer, Mr. Agalga. He stood here at the forecourt of this, exactly where we are standing, and told the whole world that they decided to exercise their option, their discretion, to institute this action against me, this application against me, um, as a victim. They chose me as a victim. Uh, Katie Hammond is nobody's victim at all. This morning is on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, we stay on the Akonsombo and Pondam spillage and its devastating effects, focusing on uh, what appears, in, in fact, and is uh, turning out to be a health crisis in the affected areas and also look into the future. We are asking the critical question of what happens to the affected structures. I mean, these buildings you're seeing on the screen there, that have been inundated by the flood waters. Some of the buildings have actually been, as we speak now, submerged under the flood waters, almost to the roofing level, some beyond the roofing level as well. Now, there have been concerns about how this would impact on the structural integrity of uh, these buildings. So we, we have just videos of some of these buildings that have been submerged under these flood waters. Now, take a look at this. And uh, these areas, Mepe, and then also uh, uh, Sogakope, and some other parts of the uh, Central Tong and North Tong districts, a number of the buildings there, and Gemini as well, uh, in the South Dai uh, area, have also all been submerged in water. Completely. We've seen buildings that have been submerged completely in these flood waters. And, 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 and that's quite worrying, to say the least. And th th these are the areas uh, where the grid coal substation also located as well. All these buildings um, have been submerged in the flood waters. And that raises fundamental questions as well about how this is going to impact on the structural integrity of, of these buildings uh, that we're talking about. Now... I want you to take a look at the satellite imagery of these areas we're talking about. It's a very widespread area, at least, in where the, the, uh, the Sakonsombo Dam takes its source of water from. That's the Volta Lake. And how all of this connects straight from the Black Volta all the way into the White Volta. And then how that impacts as well on the various communities along the lake. That is it. This is the satellite imagery that, that we got from Google Map. Look at where the Pong, the Pong Dam is. The Pong Dam also takes its source from the Volta River. And that's in the parts of the eastern region. That's the Pong Dam that you see there. This is how the situation or the place looks like as we speak. Now, because of the uh, amount of water that's coming through from both the white, black, and red Volta, which has led to flooding along uh, the various communities around it that stretches all the way into the greater Accra region. We are also seeing many other places like the OT Volta, and then also the parts of the greater Accra region, and then also the Eastern region, where recording flooding 
in uh, the Western North region and then some parts also of the uh, Northern region, Bandai district specifically, in the, in the Bono East as well. So this is the path that the Volta River travels. The black image that you see there, that that's represents the Volta River's path all the way through to many, many, many regions. That's the Bono East region, um, Sine East, Sine West, Pru East, all of these affected. Now, let's take you to Mepe. If you see the, the sharp curve there of the path that this river travels, goes through the Bato RC School, the Catholic Hospital Basic in Bato, that's also been affected. Let's zoom in to Mepe. Now, this is the Mepe community, which has been totally buried under these flood waters. This is how the Google imagery looks like. And the St. Kizito Technical School, which is now serving as a safe haven for the persons who have been affected, is also close as well to the, the, the source of the river, from what we are seeing from uh, the satellite imagery. And that's quite concerning, to say the least. And there's been concerns raised about how this is also impacting on the health of the people there. Samuel Kujetua Blakwa is Member of Parliament for the North Tongue constituency. It's a heavily hit constituency in the Volta region as far as the spillage of excess water from the Akonsombo Dam is concerned. He raised issues about the health-related crisis that they're experiencing. Take a look. You recall that our uh, chiefs were appealing to the president when the president came here that if he could open Saglemi for our people to be relocated because they can't stay in classrooms, you know, for long. I mean, classrooms are not designed for res residential accommodation. Uh, but in the meantime, seeing that it doesn't appear that the president is comfortable with uh, offering Saglemi for our people, we are trying to mobilize on our own. So I want to announce that we have secured land, large tracts of land, so particular construction firms who want to come in to help us, even if it's prefab, prefab will appreciate it. The compatriots elsewhere are learning. So our children are being left behind. They are losing precious academic time. And they are all going to write the same exams, the same BEC, the same WASI. How would, they, how would they cope? So we need to relocate our people so that academic work can begin, the schools can be reopened. Then thirdly, the public health aspect of things. We really have to pay attention. I am glad that the Director General of the Ghana Health Service came here to see things for himself. He saw how precarious the situation is. I hope that he will quickly mobilize uh, a public health emergency plan and support system so that already the typhoid cases we are seeing, the cases of, uh, of uh, cholera and all of that does not, you know, blow, blow, blow out of proportion. So that's Samla Kujetua Blako talking about the health crisis that is also befalling the, uh, the North Tong constituency where he specifically speaks about the situation, the typhoid, malaria and other related uh, illnesses as a result of this spillage. Well, we'll be connected with Dr. Senano Kwesi Jokoto shortly. He is the Deputy Director of Health Services in the Volta region. But this is the Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Patrick Kumabwaje. You heard uh, Samuel Kujato Ablakwa made reference to what he said. This is it. Broadly, our response is how do we ensure that um, diarrheal diseases do not occur? Because in flooding, you are going to have feces and water mixing up and also contaminating foods. We are also created satellites, treatment centers. So far, medicines and supplies are available. I have also directed that for those people who may have lost their health insurance cards or do not have resources, the facility should offer uh, free care in the interim whilst we find solutions to address these challenges. We have GMA to also offer free care to the displaced people, including the Ghana Registered Nurse and Midwives Association, as well as, as well as the Sacrosa Society of Ghana, who are also moving to Volta Region to offer care. From the aspect of health, we have not reached any situation where we need to look at that. I think the response is okay. 
there are enough resources within the very regions where they are going to be able to contain it. But if it gets out of hand, it's like that. Well, so that's the Director General of the Ghana Health Service there, Dr. Patrick Komabaji. Let's stay a bit further on this because there are fears that this situation could be a health crisis already playing out as these affected areas by, by the floods due to the spillage uh, from the Aconsobo and the, and the dams. But what exactly is the reality of the situation on the ground? Let's go now. And uh, fortunately, we've been joined on Zoom by Dr. Senanu Kwesi Jokoto. He's a Deputy Voter Regional Director of Health at the Ghana Health Service. I thank you so much, Dr. Senanu Jokoto, for connecting with us here on Ghana tonight. First off, just give us an idea. What are some of the illnesses that, uh, as a result of this spillage, you, you're dealing with, especially with the persons who have been affected? Some look, you took a black one mentioned typhoid and malaria. Are you, are you recording a lot more of these? Okay, thank you very much. So, for the health system, we usually have an entire response system that we are looking at. Uh, so, we are, we are not firefighting and looking for only one particular kind of disease. We have priority diseases that we are looking out for, um, not only in health facilities, but in the communities as well. So we have, we have what we call the enhanced cerebellums. We know that in such circumstances, we are going to have diseases that are waterborne and vectorborne. So when you say waterborne, we are referring to uh, diseases like cholera. That's an epidemic prone disease, and I'm sure that is what most health uh, uh, practitioners would fear. Uh, we are also looking at typhoid fever, uh, all kinds of infections with E. coli, with cardiacids, paratyphi, all those uh, infections that we are looking out for. There are some vector borne diseases that we are also looking out for. Um, for, for example, malaria, because of the, the exposure to the weather. People are sleeping rough. They are sleeping in classrooms. Some are, some are sleeping in open spaces. Uh, they are exposed to mosquito bites. The environment is good for the mosquito to breed. So we are expecting to see an increased number of, of malaria cases if there is no intervention. So all these ca cases would escalate if there is no intervention. So the focus of our response system is first of all to try and prevent. So we are doing a lot of risk communication so that people adopt the right behaviors. Then we are doing a lot of social mobilization so, so that um, everybody will come in and support and get people what they actually need. Then on, on, on top of that, we are also getting, working out with all the organizations to provide safe drinking water ensure that there is proper sanitation and then there's hygiene. To be able to monitor all these disease conditions, you have to be aware of how you, the, the disease patterns in those particular areas over the period. So we've done our own review of records over the past, past five years. We know what our data looks like. Mm -hmm. So if there's any deviation, then we can see that there's something going on that is not right. That may point to an, an epidemic. Aside that, we have right. case definitions for some of these epidemic-prone diseases like cholera, as I've mentioned. Mm -hmm. So any time anything looks like cholera, uh, we quickly test. So we've deployed test kits into those, area, those areas mm -hmm. uh, to quickly pick up these diseases. Once we pick it up early, we are able to deal with it, isolate treat so that uh, it doesn't spread quickly. We also have to note that these diseases have incubation periods. That's from the period where the infection or the pathogen or germ, let me put it loosely, would enter into a human being system up to the time that the disease signs and symptoms would manifest. And for most of these diseases, it may take seven days, 14 days, 21 days. Uh, so again, we, we know that even if we are not recording some of those cases, we know that we still have to be on the higher alert. Right. So as I speak to you now, uh, we've not recorded any epidemic-prone disease like cholera. 
we've also not seen an increase in the incidence of diarrhea cases. We've not seen an increased incidence in malaria cases. What we've rather seen for now is the stress-related diseases like hypertension because people have lost their belongings. Mm. They've lost their property. Infrastructure they have invested with their entire life savings uh, underwater currently. So people who are not even previously hypertensive, you screen them and their BPs are high up in the roof. So luckily, we've been able to mobilize some psychosocial therapists who have been also engaging the populace or the affected population so that, uh, well, they would come to terms and know that there is support coming for them. There are people who are ready to also help them throughout this very difficult situation. Mm. Um, so, um, like I said, right. it's an entire holistic uh, response. But the Dr. Dr. That, let me read you know, the fact that we have not recorded any of these cases. Right. Does not mean that we should be begin to relax on some of the interventions that we've already put in place. We really have to intensify so that um, we we do not record cases because our aim is to mitigate. Right. You see, there, there's a concern about uh, the risk of these persons who have been affected consuming the water that has been contaminated. Have you confirmed any cases of persons consuming contaminated water and being exposed to the risk associated with it? Yes, if there, there was no education in that regard, and if there was no intervention, people would have been taking this contaminated water. This water is contaminated by fecal matter. The water is also contaminated by uh, by my materials from uh, where we've had cemeteries over over a number of years. Uh, we have dead animals under this water: livestock, goat, sheep, those that were not able to escape the wrath of the flood water. All this mixed in this water. So definitely, we have a lot of germs or pathogens in the water. So if people drink it, they will definitely fall ill. So the first intervention was to send this message out to them. But if they did not have an option, they will still go ahead and drink it. So we had to quickly work with all the other agencies. And let me commend VRA, NADMO. They've been able to mobilize some water, uh, safe drinking water, uh, to the affected population. And um, with, together with the education that I talked about, don't drink water uh, contaminated, uh, don't use it to prepare food, don't use it uh, to wash your plates, mm. don't bath with that kind of water. Yeah. And anytime that water touches you, make sure that you get clean water to, to clean it off. And if you have sanitizers as well, you have to apply it. So but you see, the, you the, 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 the issue uh, there, uh, Dr. Jokoto, and, and that's a quick one before I let you go. The last time we spoke, you had indicated that about 12,000 of these uh, persons who have been uh, displaced are on your radar for, and you're monitoring them for health related illness ex exposures. So, has that number increased? Because we understand a little over 22,000 people have been displaced in, in the Volta region alone as a result of this. So the, we are, uh, as much as possible, uh, you know, it's a very fluid situation that more communities are getting affected. Uh, NADMO is, is working at getting all that data. So the data as of today, I will not be able to tell you, but I, I will be able to tell you that there, there's been an increase in the number of figures in the safe havens. And because it's a fluid situation, some people are able to also get in touch with relatives uh, who are on higher ground. And some may leave the safe havens and go to um, their uh, other, other communities. But as, as I speak now, for the safe havens alone, uh, the 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 figure we have from NATO 
is I think 4,318 uh, thereabouts. That's those in the safe havens. They have no relatives to go to. They have no friends to go to. They have to contend with sleeping in, in tents in open classrooms on these uh, safe havens. But like, this is for only North Tong, the, the 15 safe havens in North Tong. Uh, you have other places in Central Tong and then South Tong. Uh, so all put together, uh, we know that uh, those who have been displaced uh, should be much more than the 12,000 that we are talking about. Mm. But the affected population, like you know, is way beyond the displaced population. Indeed. Uh, Dr. Jokoto, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Dr. Senanukwesi Jokoto is uh, Deputy Voter Regional Director of Health Services. Uh, joining us on the list. Stay a bit further on this. And I'm going to show you um, the structures, a few of the structures that have been submerged under these this flood waters in the areas like uh, Germany and, and also some parts of the North Tong area. Now, questions have been raised about the structural integrity of these buildings. So we're looking into the future. After this water recedes from these areas, is it that people who own these buildings and hotels and others can just pack in and occupy the buildings or some, something has to be done to at least confirm the structural integrity of these buildings that have been inundated under these, these flood waters? Now, take a look at this. It will tell you a clear uh, view of how things are looking like when it comes to buildings that have been submerged under these flood waters. Now, you, you see um, in areas such as the, the Mepe area and then also the Germany area, look at this particular building, for instance. Almost the entire building is under the flood waters, and most of it are at the roofing level. You see some of the buildings as well that have been submerged totally under the flood waters. Now, question is, after the number of days that the VRA uh, predicted that this pledge will be over and the water recedes, what happens next to these buildings? That is a forward-moving conversation that, that we intend to have tonight. Engineer Abdullahi Mahama is, is, is joining us, a civil and structural engineer, joining us. Thank you so much, Engineer Abdullah Mahama, for time here on Ghana Tonight. So we've just, I'm sure you've seen these buildings that we, we're showing right now. So what, what happens to the structural integrity of these buildings? And, and also, especially for the people who own it, what should they do? Okay, so what we normally would do as engineers is that um, mostly concrete has nothing to do, or it, does, it's not, it doesn't become undermined with the I mean, contact of water for as long as it is. Uh, once it has already attained its desired strength when the design was done and the construction was executed. Um, what we may have worry is the mud houses, which are uh, actually situated within the catchment area that I'm sure by now, most of them would have just collapsed. But when we come back after the water has actually subsided, what the build, especially with the, uh, what do you call it, the corporate buildings, or let's say the, one that, the public buildings, because some of them are storage buildings, the engineers may have to go in and then conduct the structural integrity analysis on the buildings. One, what they will do is that they will look at the, the foundation whether the foundations are situated at very ideal uh, uh, depth on the ground. And then they will look at the concrete, especially the columns, because most of the suspended slabs will not come into contact with the water. So the columns will be, at, will be, will be checked. They have to look at the, the strength of the, the concrete by just conducting the normal routine structural integrity analysis that is done mostly for any structure. But when you look at the uh, block work, if the block works of some of the buildings are exposed, as is, they have not been plastered, they will be very saturated. With time, most of them, which are actually getting the right mix, would, would have hardened after the water actually recedes, and then they will come back to normal. But those that have not been plastered, and they have not been proportionately produced 
by the specification of the standards, most of them would wither away. And that would be a source of concern to most of them. But my concern is that most of the structure that ought to be structurally uh, uh, certified will be the public ones first and foremost before we look at the individual houses that are within the area. We may also talk about the road network. Most, most of the time, when we are doing the design for road network, the pavement design, we have something we call the CBR. Now the CBR, you actually get the, uh, the proper materials and then they are compacted and soaked in water for 96 day, uh, 96 hours. It means that you are just imagining or anticipating that should you have a, a particular type of layer which comes into contact for 96 hours, which is four days, how would the, how would the material behave in that saturated state? And these are all done when we are doing either road construction or structural uh, buildings alike. So when the water finally comes down, these are the few things that in the engineers will just go in and then conduct to actually certify the, the, the stability of the buildings or otherwise of the, the, the situations that we may be confronted with after the I, I, I see. Water. So, in general, it's not the case that these, in fact, we have hotels and other private, privately owned business installations that have also been affected. So these private residences and, and then also some hospitals and, and these hotels, you know, I see people who own these buildings can just pack their stuff and go back in there after the, the water recedes. Something needs to be done, correct? That's what I'm saying that they have to, they have, if they are like the hotel, for instance, the hotel has to engage a structural engineer. Mostly the structural integrity analysis report is done by two engineers. One third is the material engineer team and then the structural engineer. These people work together. So the material engineer will look at the foundation depth and to see whether the foundation was done in accordance with the drawings that were actually sent to the assembly for approval. And the structural engineer will also look at the strength of the concrete, i.e. the columns and then the, the slabs, whichever one that came into contact with water for all these durations might be taken into consideration and then they will do those tests and then they will certify whether the building is structurally sound to be cohabited or may have to be down and may have to get some touches down to actually retrofit some of the buildings to just uh, enhance the, the 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 strength that is desired for cohabitation of the building but but if the the 96 are uh, um analysis that you just mentioned for the roads especially is anything to go by the, the water the excess water we we're talking about has inundated these communities for for almost a week now in fact, it's been a little over a week. So clearly, the, the roads that have been tarred in these areas has been compromised. But the, the design is such that you only do 96 hours to actually have a fair idea. It doesn't necessarily mean that when the road is actually inundated with the flood waters, it means that even though it goes beyond a certain number of, let's say, beyond the 96 hours, it means the road will go back. They will come inside, they will come after the water, they will do what we call the quarry. They will call some of the sample and run the various tests on the roads to just uh, establish those things. And this has normally done within a matter of like some maximum of about four or five days, some of these tests ought to be resolved. And I'm not too sure that once the roads are actually, you see, the asphalt is a seal on the roads. So you may have a road which is actually inundated with the flood waters, but the water may not actually come or saturate all the various layers if the asphalt or the bitumen is properly laid and there are no exposures on the surface, we may have some few uh, areas where the the uh, what we will have some potholes that would let those areas be very highly saturated. But because we we compact the various class of material during the construction stages, you have to get a certain average compaction rate, which is like ninety five percent and ninety eight percent. In some instances, you have to do nine hundred percent compaction. That means that once the material is highly consolidated in that manner, you may not have the water actually going through, even though the surrounding of the, the material would have some saturation, but you will not have just full penetration because this material has actually artificially been compacted to attain a certain level that almost all the pores in the, in the material is highly uh, uh, reduced. So there's no pores that will allow saturation of water. In the, but you can see that sometimes when we have roads which are constructed, and any other day we have rainfall. Sometimes the road does not actually dry up and there will be another rainfall. There will be another rainfall. So it's almost the same thing that you see 
uh, on our roads, which would have any other day run off on them. It will not necessarily mean that the roads are going to go bad. Not but good. like I said, it is just a matter of time. Once the water uh, finally disappears, these are the then areas that have to deal with by the engineers. With, with Indeed. Well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, look, uh, th this is just um, to have a clear idea of, of how things are going to play out after the water recedes and what has to be done so that it's not lost out on us. That structural integrity analysis has to be done on all the buildings that we are seeing that have been also submerged in these flood waters. Very important point there, Engineer uh, Abdullah Mahama. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, Ghanaian economist and leadership expert Professor Stephen Aday has called to question the leadership of President Kofuado. We'll hear from the man. Just so you know, he's enjoyed a number of appointments uh, from the president in that he is criticizing now, but he's indicated quite clearly that if President Kofuado doesn't redeem himself in the next 14 months, he will go down in history as one of the most disappointing leaders in this country. Take a look. This road contract will be given to you provided you put one million up front, though, not that when you get your money. Then, and this is what Akufuado must be thinking about, and if he knows about it, must be ashamed of, that now his people demand from you a certain amount before you be considered for the job. Why? Because then when you, they get it, whether you, the government pays you or not, they have gotten their money. As if people are in a hurry to loot the country before the end of Akufuado's term. One of the greatest disappointments of uh, Akufuado's regime is that, honestly, he raised the hope of Ghanaians. Ghanaians expected that we had gotten the leader with a vision, with the charisma, with the determination. And it seems if he doesn't redeem himself in the next 14 months, he will go down in history of the, one of the most disappointing leaders. And what the co corruption, the arrogance, the thing that there is, Ghana is for them, and that, you know, without them, Ghana would not be there, even think, some of them thinking that they should tell us who should be our next president. God forbid. The nurses and the teachers who constituted about 75% of public service would go for loans. And because they were public servants, it was assured. Now they are run away, and they can't pay. So I have to chase them to London, to America, and that thing. So the small banks, I know one which has about 7 million Ghana cities, they are chasing, they have to write off. He anticipates that citizens will hold leaders accountable to promote growth and development. Well, that's Professor Stephen Adair there. Let's find out if he is the only one who holds this particular verdict on President Kofuado so far as president of the Republic of this country, Ghana. Professor Enoch Enchi is a leadership and governance expert, a lecturer at the, uh, th that's Academic City University, also joining us. Professor Enoch Enchi, thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. That's the verdict of uh, Professor Stephen Adair. Redeem yourself in 14 months, or you're going to go down as one of the most disappointing leaders in this country. That's to President Kofor. Are you sharing that? Yes, 100% I agree with Professor Day on this. Leadership is your character in action, and Nanado's character is seen in his leadership, what is going on out there. If you look at the flood and the way our emergency action was not, you know, if you look at the spillover at Kusumbo and the way we handled it, we handled it poorly. When the president went there, even what he said, you know, did not show the empathy people were looking for because you have to show empathy and then promise government support in that situation. And there is a reason why morals always triumph over policies because in such situations, people expect you to show solidarity and then empathy. And the Italian word for empathy is to walk into something. So when you walk into something, you understand how the people feel. Older people who might not have been able to get out of the spillage, 
Adakosomboda, people who have lost their homes, and we were expecting more from the government and then the other agencies. So, uh, you know, I think that the expectations for Nanado is different for any other president Ghana has ever produced because three times he ran, people thought that Nanado was really great, but the Ghanaians were not giving him the chance to prove his leadership. And when he's given the leadership mantle, he's falling below the expectations of Ghanaians. So uh, he still has the 14 months that Professor Adair talked about to redeem himself because the expectation for Nanado is not what he's delivering. And people think he can do more. I see. Professor Nogretri, how much of a difference can be done or made in 14 months to change this verdict from where you sit? It can be done in 14 months. The first thing you need to do is to find employment for the youth. I am always talking about jobs, jobs, and jobs. The youth need jobs, period. Ghanaian youth don't have anything to do. And most of them are on the streets selling anything that they can lay hands on. And it's not helping the economy. I think that the police are doing a great job, but the government in terms of security, because when people don't have jobs, crime rate increases. So the police are doing a great job in coiling a crime in the country, but he needs to do more in finding jobs for the people. He needs to do more on the debt level. We are, you know, swallowing in debt. So most of the youth need jobs. The government should find a way to provide jobs for the people. Three, the exchange rate of the city, there's a lot of fluctuations. The city needs to be stabilized in his term. Four, there's a lot of infrastructure deficit. If you look at our roads, terrible. If you look at, we still have schools and hospitals and street lights. Most of the places in Ghana are in darkness. The president, who is a human rights lawyer, and then people thought that he was going to fight corruption. In his inaugural speech, he said that if you need money, then you, are, you, you cannot be in his government because the private sector is where money is. But we've seen a lot of stories of individuals who are even sitting on money. We know these stories in the media and everywhere on our platforms. And yet the president is saying that, well, they have served diligently and faithfully to him. So I think that the faithfulness is not supposed to be to the president, but to the constitution of our land. And a lot of scandals, because a president, when you lead office, you are judged by the number of scandals in your government. That is corruption. So any scandal that the media talked about is a potential corruption. That is a dent on your leadership. Professor Nokenchi, thank you very much for your thoughts on this. He is a leadership and governance expert. Professor Nokenchi, appreciate your time. Up, coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, before we go for this quick break, the quest for, of the Electoral Commission of Ghana to use the Ghana card as a sole document for registering voters has been opposed, even though they also insist it is the most robust system. Tonight, we ask why the Ghana card really and, and how different it's going to be from this guarantee system that they want to do away with, since the Ghana card process itself also uses a guarantee system in the registration for it. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to demonstrate to you the superior properties of Flamingo paint as compared to other paint brands on the market. We take equal quantities of Flamingo paint and this ordinary paint. We then dilute them with water. And now, let the test begin. The gentleman on the left is going to apply the ordinary paint and the gentleman on my right will use the Flamingo superior paint. As you can clearly see, Flamingo has the obvious better hiding. Furthermore, Flamingo has painted a much larger area. You know, one bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint is made with superior formulation to give superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. Everybody knows Acrobato. And if you know Acrobato, it means you know M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. M Punch Homeopathy Clinic is my pillar. Let's hear what others are saying about M Punch 
from your party clinic. Who will be careful at airport to one Ha! Just an amyan Cassami Prod, unless a problem is womb. It's not my own way, dear mammy. Papa patches and any answer to her. I'm quite points, you know, shame me with your monom baby, and also woman do, mammy do me fine, and my own crammy, you know, go for one, I'm quite more. Eba, and everything yourself. Be mammy, no, I do, and the whole wound to me, Nancy. And then you call end point, or mamma, and then the white dear, what's me, I'm sorry, and Nancy. That's end point for you. Oh, my brother, too. Hello. Hey, what's your chair? Okay. A free bra would be end point, what does it? I'm a choir, you know. Me just say my name quickly, and pass on my name and the Medina Sabema. Now, when we fear for the one in the Jarasa, you had everything. I have secret. M point is my secret. M point from your party clinic. I'm free. Our mission here at TV3 is that the news comes first, and that's the promise of News Central. With reporters every corner of the country. To attain their action through production, through the lions, and experts across the subjects that affect you the most. We stay across the big stories that impact you the most as they break, develop, and evolve into major national issues. With all angles covered across the country and across every subject. I am Kemini Amano. And I am Eric Mawina Egbeta. New Central, coming soon on TV3. TV3, first in news. Welcome back to Ghana Tonight. A joint civil society organization is urging the Electoral Commission to reconsider its plan to make a Ghana card the sole document for voter registration. Now, the Community Focus Foundation Ghana, Democratic Credentials Network, and the Coalition of Ghanaians without the Ghana card. They're making the argument that the guarantor system's high usage during the limited voter registration exercise suggests its usefulness has not waned. Take a look. Before the 2023 limited voters' registration ended, the Electoral Commission indicated that the guarantor system had outlived its usefulness and must be abolished. The Electoral Commission believes that the guarantor system has outlived its usefulness, and we are convinced that the time is right for a system that every registrant is identified on its or her own merit, rather than another person vouching for the age and nationality of that person. Preliminarily, we will say that there are a lot of factors why people are using the guarantor system, which we need to get into it. But clearly, it's possible some people may not be qualified. At the end of the exercise, however, over 61% of all registrants relied on the guarantor system. The joint CSOs argued that this indicates that the system should not be abandoned. We contend that if the CIA is passing its current form or shape, it will completely disenfranchise millions of prospective voters who, for no fault of theirs, are unable to obtain the Ghana card issued by the National Identification Authority, NIA, contravening the rights provided for Ghanaians under Article 42 of the 1992 Constitution. The reason for this unpopular decision by the EC, the public is yet to be told. They also called on the president to reassign the commissioners of the EC deemed politically tainted. That appointment of politically exposed individuals. Uh, so th these are the concerns that they raise. If there's a fundamental issue about the, the reliance of the guarantor system because people still don't have the Ghana card. And that was very evident in the, uh, the li limited voter registration exercise that ended not too long ago. Now, this is according to the Electoral Commission's own statistics. Take a look at this. The number of people who had to use the guarantor system, have someone guarantee for them, before they could actually be registered during the limited voter registration exercise. Take a look. The, according to the Electoral Commission, the total number of persons they were able to register during the limited voter registration exercise is 910,996. Out of that, 471,242 were male. That's which 1.7%. Female registrants, 439,754, representing 48.3%. Take a look at this. The registration pair document, Ghana card, 344,346. That's about 
the guarantor system had the highest. So 563,919 people, that's 61.9% of the 910,996 people relied on the guarantor system because they did not have the Ghana card to get registered. Then you have the passports, 2,711. So that, that's the fundamental concern there. With, with these huge numbers of the uh, people relying on the Garanta system, talking about 50, 563,000, almost 564,000 people still relying on the Garanta system, the EC still has concerns about the Garanta system. This is what they say is the issue. Take a look at this. They raised a the fundamental issue about the Garanta system being says on the guarantor system, the commission is of the view that under the current circumstances, the guarantor system has outlived its usefulness and cannot be maintained. The best proof of a person's citizenship is a Ghana card. So the use of the guarantor system is fraught with blatant abuse and witness in the just ended voter registration exercise. Samo Tete is the deputy commissioner of the electoral commission making this point. And then uh, it says, talk about most countries in the sub-region, uh, Nigeria's South Africa, Senegal, Rwanda, and Kenya do not use the guarantor system. But that's what's happening in those countries. Okay, but in Ghana, to the extent that people don't have the Ghana card, and the evidence we saw in the just ended limited registration exercise lays credence to the fact that people still need the guarantor system to get in, then what happens next? It says, if indeed we are committed to strengthening our electoral process, then the guarantor system must be abolished sooner than later and they're calling on government to fund the NIA. Nana Akosia Frimpong Sapong is chairperson of the CPP. She's joining us on, on Zoom. Thank you, madam, for joining us here on, on Ghana tonight. You sit, or your representative sits through the IPAC meetings of the Electoral Commission. This is what they are saying. They are still convinced about the Ghana card being the sole document for registration, despite the evidence of people still relying on the guarantor system in the just ended limited registration exercise, madam. The guarantor system clearly is a very straightforward arrangement for now, since this is the first time that Ghana is actually going through a clear data system. I mean, trying to data the people. However, um, the Ghana card, if it was efficient and the registration was more straightforward one would, one would understand but because it's a third party and we all know the issues and problems that ghana card is currently faced the mandate for ghana card and mandate for uh, ec is completely different so one would expect that ec shouldn't should just continue with the uh, guarantor system just that they should make it so that um nobody is penalized for any lapse in the system. So that is what I say. They should continue with the guarantor system. I don't think they should go with the Ghana card because it's a third party. And had you, when you are mandated by law to do something and then you just leave it for, for a, a third party that is clearly, clearly has problems and we all know the issues that are faced, all Ghanaians face the frustration with the with the Ghana card, so I I think that EC should should clearly look at it again. I, I see, but then again, the Electoral Commission, as we read, some of the makes the point that the guarantor system was abused, and so minors and and uh, foreigners may have gotten onto an electoral roll. That's their position. But but the Ghana card also has a guarantor system. I did my Ghana card through a guarantor system. <laughs> but the day I was, uh, I was uh, going to have a Ghana card, I used my, my daughter and a niece that guaranteed for me. So what are they talking about? It's the same thing. Today, if you, unless Ghana card is going to take the guarantor system out, and then there will be too many complications. We are now going through a system, we, have, we don't, we don't have uh, our birth certificate properly done over the years. It's, Ghana is not starting from a point. So once you start anything from a point, you are, you are, you are bound to have issues 
in terms of who is really a Ghanaian and who is not. But mm -hmm. after a short period of time, it will be clear. Because if you're a, Ghana, a Ghanaian at, uh, currently in Ghana, you'd have been expected to have uh, registered. I think that all these institutions should aim at doing is to make life convenient and easy for us. Hmm. It looks as though one is one feels like they, they are rather uh, doing us a service, and, and 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 I think that is where the problem, the attitude must change. And the that's where the concern is. The of using technology is to make life convenient. Right. And uh, Dr. Sai Kwapong is also uh, joining us for a quick one on this. It's a Democracy and Development Federal, the Center for Democratic Development, CDD. Uh, Dr. Kwapong, to the extent that, and that's what Nana Akosia Frimpon upon the point she was making, that with the Garanta system, it is still used in the process of registering for the Ghana card, the Garanta system. The EC wants to do away with that because they say it's fraught with, with, with uh, its own challenges. Is there any merit in this particular position that he takes? Thank you very much, um, Alfred. And that's a key point that you raise, which is if the problem is the guarantee system for uh, the voters' registration, then if the same guarantee system is being used for the Ghana card process, then I think I'm a little confused as to why the EC uh, would trust the Ghana card, which allows the guarantee system as part of the process of acquisition. Uh, do, uh, so for me, that's the um, that's the point that is a little, you know, um, you know, confusing. If the Ghana card system and the process did not have a guarantor system, which is what the EC is worried about, then I can understand how the EC then would end on the position of saying, if we really want to eliminate foreigners and minors of the voter registration system, then the surest way to do it uh, is by using the Ghana card as the sole means of identification for registration. Uh, unless the Ghana card process is doing something different that builds in an extra barrier that gives an assurance that the guarantor system is not being manipulated. But if the EC's contention is with the guarantor system, then I'm not sure how or why it is comfortable um, using another process which also relies as one of the forms of um, you know, uh, demonstrating that you are a citizen is the use of the guarantor system. I appreciate your time on this, Dr. Jordan Sakwapon. Thank you very much. Uh, Democracy and Development Federal with the CDD. Nana Akosia from Poma Sapong, a chairperson of the CPP. Thank you as well for joining us here on Ghana tonight. But before we go, uh, we've been calling on you, our viewers, uh, to also come and help us to help the people who have been impacted by the situation in not just the Volta region, but in all the other regions that we've talked about. So let's lend a helping hand today. You can donate clothes, mattresses, blankets, provisions, toiletries, and food items. You can bring it to the TV3 premises. Or you can send your monetary donations to the mobile money number 0597433110. 59 under the three foundation umbrella. That's our social support arm at Media Journal. The reference for your money should be Akosombo Spillage, 0597433110, or the merchant ID 120494, 120494. And for those of you who also want to send us through the Zenith Bank Ghana Limited, we have an account at the Kojo Thompson Road branch, Zenith Bank Ghana Limited. The account number is 60106039270. And the sort code is 120104. Please help us to help these people who have been displaced by the spillage of the excess water from the Akonsobo and the Pong dams. Thank you very much for staying with us here on Ghana tonight. Join us same time tomorrow. I'm Alfred Akansi. Have a good night.
Ghana Tonight is brought to you by Flamingo Paint, superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage, simply superior.